This is the e-learning podcast, episode number 80. The thing about learning video is learning how to tell a story in the video medium. Um, and that story for us sometimes is as dry as, you know, what is HTML? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, a lot of other types of training videos have a story and it's using the video format to tell that story. That can be done with an iPhone. Welcome to the eLearn Podcast. My name's Laddick, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. My guest for today is Mark Lassoff, a founder of Framework Tech Media. After achieving tremendous success on platforms like Udemy with his quality video content, Mark shares with us his wisdom and expertise on his video experience learning platform, as well as in communities and the world's most popular ed tech conferences. In this visually focused conversation, Mark and I talk about his experience with creating compelling video. Newsflash, it's not about equipment. It's about telling an engaging story. We also talk about mastering video, which rather than knowing about lighting or sound, which, okay, they do matter, it has to do more with things like storytelling, character building, and making sure you're connecting with your audience. We also talk about raising your online teaching bar by raising your video game, by doing things like checking new trends and tools, playing around and experimenting, and maybe considering lowering your PowerPoint dependence. And then finally, Mark and I talk about how to achieve a satisfying experience because it's best not to compare your work with other educational content, but to your learners' ideas of compelling and entertaining media. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The eLearning Podcast is sponsored by the eLearn Success Series, a uniquely valuable set of events that bring together sector experts and thought leaders to offer solutions to the most critical challenges and issues at the intersection of education and technology. Get your free ticket to all four sessions at eLearnSuccessSeries.com. And Open LMS a company that provides world-class LMS solutions that empower organizations to meet education and workplace learning needs. Learn more by visiting openlms.net. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the eLearning Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me to join you. My pleasure, as always, on all of these shows. Mark, where do we find you sitting in the world today? I am in beautiful Westport, Connecticut. It is the uh, town that Martha Stewart used to live in. And when she left, wrote an article in the New York Times telling everybody why. Oh, why she left or why she used to live there? Why she left. Yeah. <laughs> why she why she got got the hell out. That was her. <laughs> that was her big article in the New York Times. It made us all proud. <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that. Like, do, do I ask about Martha? Not? No, this is about you. This is about you and video and e-learning essentially that's martha I, martha ironically is also about you well martha is about martha um yes <laughs> let's let's move on so um you are uh the ceo the founder of framework tech media um mm -hmm. you are a face many people uh, and a voice many people have heard before in the e-learn guild and you know around the circuit talking about why video is so important in e-learning and those kinds of things so i'm really excited to have you on the show to really kind of put your opinion on the table about not only video and online learning, but what, how to do it better, what, you know, what, what people do wrong and, you know, whether or not it's, whether it's not something we even need to worry about. Um, but before we do that, I want to give you the opportunity to have the, you know, 30, 60 seconds to just sort of put yourself on the stage and say, you know, explain who you are and kind of what you focus on. Yeah. So my name is, of course, Mark Lassoff, and I have been involved in online learning for the past 20 years. Um, mostly as an instructor. So I have developed rich systems for developing video-based training classes and delivering them both for clients and in our own off-the-shelf library of courses that uh, are available for license and for resale. Mm. Um, and then I contribute to, well, I hope it's a contribution, but I contribute to the profession by speaking and training at various conferences. You'll find me at all the guild conferences at ATD. Um, so if you see me somewhere, come say hi and, and strike up a conversation. I'm always trying to learn 
about other parts of the business and, and uh, meet new people because this is a really fun business to be in. I've met a lot of great people and great friends. And so that's basically me. Fantastic. And I'm sure, you know, I, what I, what I love is, you know, our, we know our audience is people who you, who probably know who you are. I guess so I'm, I'm interested to see like what their reactions are. I want to hear, I want to see the smiles, you know, behind the voice. So uh, we've had other people on the show, but also in the e-learning success summit, people know about uh, that we've run the past couple of years talk about video, but I want to hear, you know, so somebody who's been doing this for 20 years, we're now in 2022, you and I are recording this sort of in January, late January, 2022. What do you need for, you know, for actually doing good video or, or for shooting video for, for online learning? What's, what's your minimum list of things that you need to have? So a lot of people make the mistake about thinking that good video is about expensive equipment um, mm -hmm. and, you know, setting up an expensive studio. And even though I have a studio right over here, um, that's not the way to start in video and it's not necessary to shoot good learning video. The thing about learning video is learning how to tell a story in the video medium. Um, and that story for us sometimes is as dry as, you know, what is HTML? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, a lot of other types of training videos have a story and it's using the video format to tell that story. That can be done with an iPhone. Mm -hmm. The iPhone today has a better camera than most cameras that were available 10 years ago. So it's really about how to create shots that inform, that educate, and that entertain. And I think the other important thing to remember is we are in a much more media-rich world than we were 20 years ago when I started in this. Mm -hmm. With YouTube, with advances in video games, movies, special effects, and people's constant connection to internet and media, the expectation level for learners has gone up. I think sometimes our industry acts as if we're in some kind of vacuum and other media isn't out there. But the fact is people aren't comparing learning content to other learning content. They aren't saying, wow, that, you know, that course on uh, diversity in the workplace was, was much more entertaining than the one I took on you know, learning to use Excel. Yeah. They're really making comparisons to other media that they consume. And that's YouTube, video games, uh, Netflix, and you know, the serial media that people binge watch. So video, I think, is a necessary component of raising the bar in learning. So people are as engaged as they are by other media. And we can, I mean, one of the case studies that we can point to is the rise of masterclass where, mm -hmm. you know, here's, here, this is, you know, self-paced asynchronous learning, you know, at, at its best, but the value proposition or the, the business proposition behind that entire effort was let's really put a lot of production into this and mm -hmm. then get big names, right? Obviously big names help as well, but they've created an experience that is, would you, I, I don't know, would you agree? Has it set the bar for so I think I delivering mean, my, instruction? Yeah. I mean, so my bar is different than a typical instructional designer's bar. Mm. I, I think a typical instructional designer goes into this and looks at adherence to learning theory and outcome basis. And they list all the learning objectives in the beginning and, and all of those things that I, I think you know, can be important, but my scale is engagement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's more engaging than getting the inside scoop from your favorite film director, graphic designer, chef, or, you know, a personality. So, I mean, I think in that level, Masterclass is extremely successful. I, I actually had a conversation uh, with uh, one of the uh, executives at LinkedIn Learning about it. Mm -hmm. And the delineation, though, is, it's really kind of at the cross section of entertainment and learning. You know, it's not the best solution if you want to learn graphic design, but if you are a passionate graphic designer and you want to take a course from someone at the absolute top, if you are a passionate writer and you want to see how top film writers write their, you know, execute their craft, I think masterclass is great. There's a whole range, and video has enabled that. And I, I would look at as another case study. Let's look at Udemy. 
right, mm. which is an open marketplace where people can sell their classes. Well, over Udemy's now been around 12 years. I was actually one of the first instructors to earn a million dollars in commissions on the Udemy platform. Mm, congratulations. So I have, I, thank you. So I have some insight into how that works. And, you know, over time, what has risen to the top? Well, good video. Mm -hmm. And people who haven't produced good, engaging video haven't seen success on the platform. But people who know how to use the video medium to teach really have seen a great deal of success. And most people on Udemy, myself included, don't have an hour of instructional design credit. <laughs> but we're able to engage audiences and get audiences to separate, you know, to actually put their credit card in and spend their own money to purchase learning content. You know, in the corporate environment, people most often have to be compelled to do the learning in an LMS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that corporate ID, in which I, you know, that's my industry, has a ways to go when it comes to engaging. And I think video is really key because it is the easiest place to tell a story. Um, and, and, you know, if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, well, what are the thousand frames of video worth then? Mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 it's one of the richest media with which to inform if we use it correctly. So let's take it down. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it as there's, there's several different layers of where video is appropriate and also the, the type of video that you're using, right? Cause I'm, mm -hmm. I'm right now I'm thinking of the audience, um, you know, like as you and I were talking before in the green room, you know, it's about 75% teaching professionals. These are professors, these are teachers, these are, you know, cool. people who are in the training room or used to be in the training room. I, I, I often hear from them. It's just like, I already have an overflowing plate of stuff I've got to do in terms of delivering and just terms of keeping up with schedules. How the heck am I now going to be an actor or an actress or, you know, you know, think about putting video together. Where does video work? Where does it like, where, you know, is, do I have to be masterclass quality in all different places? You know, is, is compliance training as important that I, that I kill the video as it, as you know, as a leadership training, like what's your opinion on that? I think any place where there's a story to be told, where there's a visual demonstration to make, um, and where you want to best connect with learners, video is appropriate. So let's 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 take you know those three categories and, and kind of unpack them a little bit. Well, for storytelling, nothing is more efficient than video. Mm. I mean, if you're giving people paragraphs and passages of text within an e-learning. Uh, they're not going to read it mm -hmm. and it's inefficient when you can tell the story much faster with video and appeal to a much broader range of learners. Um, secondly, where you're demonstrating something, I'm sorry, visual, visual demonstration for visual processes just as natural and makes sense. So, you know, I cut my teeth as a tech instructor teaching people coding. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's obviously very visual and mm -hmm. I can easily do a video of me completing a process and explaining the code as I go. And I think third, for making the connection with the learner. Boy, we've, we've learned over the COVID period the, that there is quite a bit of value to in-person, not so much in the information transfer, but in the social aspects of learning that are, are so important. People constantly talk about the isolation and damage being done to school kids now who don't have, who haven't had, you know, through the crisis, a social outlet. And that social outlet primarily for kids was school. So mm -hmm. I think we've learned a lot. But I think the one thing that's often missing from e-learning when you choose to have a narrator versus an instructor is that relationship between the instructor and student, that level of transference that occurs, that warmth that makes people want to learn, that engages mm. people. You know, I learned a lot from really good teachers in high school and college on topics that I wasn't particularly interested in, but because they were able to engage, they crossed that bridge for me. Um, when we start with, you know, the typical in this class, you will learn A, B, and surprisingly C, <laughs> you know, we're already disconnecting from with a disconnected voice that doesn't belong to everyone that doesn't sound natural um we're already disconnecting from learners who are seeking that connection and many can't seem to learn without it you know and, and one of my qualms with a lot of the research that's done when it talks about uh you know for example there's research that shows that uh, it doesn't matter whether or not you show the instructor in a video mm. 
I, all that, all of that research comes from people who actually completed the videos. What about people who abandoned when they heard the disembodied voice and said, this isn't for me and, and closed the window? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those didn't seem to get into the research from as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think for those three areas, again, where you're um, telling a story, demonstrating something visual from coding to flying an airplane, and three, creating that relationship between instructor and learner, I think that's where video is at its most powerful. What do you think about, does this also, if I could add a fourth category just for your opinion, um, there has been an, uh, a lot of emphasis and rise of peer-to-peer -peer learning, especially in mm -hmm. this online space, because again, with that connection that people are making, but also just they're finding the engagement le levels are, are you know incredible, as well as retention levels and whatnot. <sighs> how does video play into that scenario if at all or is this is this really where it's like you kind of flip the script and it's like look we're not instructing anymore we are engaging as humans and teaching each other yeah i mean i, I think you know that's social learning right and social mm -hmm. learning has been an extremely important component of success i think it's part of the larger package of information transfer skill building and behavior change that are the goals of almost any course or learning or content that we develop right so i think you know getting people to engage one to one that peer to peer aspect can be extraordinarily important and and you know i think in for people who do what has been called MOOCs, which is a word I hate, but these massive mm. online classes, and I have some online classes that have hundreds of thousands of people in them. You know, the difference between success and failure is getting the the learners to interact with each other and to interact with the instructor. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think peer to peer is 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 a component that's a large part of the larger kind of learning milieu that 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 should be encouraged in order for people to retain information, change behavior, etc. So then that my, my, my other follow-up to that is one of the things that I've been preaching or that we've heard preached for quite a while here is stop building it, right? Stop building your course from scratch. Stop building your lessons from scratch and everything because there's so much great material already out there that's uh -huh. built for you. Where would you, you know, I guess, again, just sort of let me, let me give you the table about either using other people's video, repurposing video, you know, finding it somewhere, you know, in sort of either open source or um, yep. I guess even licensed video. Do you have uh, either opinions or resources there? I mean, I'm obviously going to be biased because, you know, one of the ways you create that we it. make money is we create video that, that others license. Right. But, you know, I think there's two types of learning that employees, we're talking strictly, you know, kind of corporate, I, you know, corporate ID here that they need, right? First is things that are common problems throughout companies for which learning has been developed. You don't need to develop your own QuickBooks course. Mm. Um, you know, you don't need to develop your own HTML course. All of that is out there. And frankly, most of a lot of what's published is going to be better than what you're going to do in house because, you know, it's, it's published by resource studios mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and distributed by companies who like kind of jury the content and only distribute stuff that's good. But then there's a type of learning that, you know, is particular to your organization, the tribal knowledge, right? Mm. How does our sales system work? You know, how do, how do we, what is our corporate branding standards? Things like that, that all needs to be developed in house. And for that, you know, you've got access to all the tools that, you know, that, that large content publishers do to be successful with. Um, so I think it's a combination. I don't think it's an either or. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, based on the learning need, you know, there's either going to be pre-made material available to address it. Uh, what some companies try and do, in my experience, which I think is, is silly, is try and reinvent the wheel just so they can slap their logo on, you know, some learning content that is essentially a commodity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. word training you know, to a large extent, is there's there's probably a hundred places you could get word training from. I hope you would purchase ours, but if not, I understand because there's lots of word training out there. No, you know, you're not using word differently at your company. You might have a different workflow, and that you need to need to build content around. So I really think it's a combination. Fantastic. I want to pivot for just a second. Um, I've heard you say, and you've you, you know, other people have heard you say that instructional design, which is you know, putting 
actually putting something together, putting, putting a class together, putting a course together. Um, it's not just one job. And this is something that we've actually been talking about a lot on this show as well. But you've said that it's actually two jobs. So I'd love to hear your, your opinion. And what do you mean that the instructional design profession is actually two jobs? Well, I think the industry has been broken by rapid content development tools um, that are ubiquitous throughout the industry because it's quick and it's cheap, but it's also required instructional designers to become, you know, an island unto themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, in my, what I always thought an ID was, because I know I'm not one, is someone who applies best practices, learning theory, research, analysis, and project management to the tasks of, again, um, information transfer, behavior change, and skill development. Mm -hmm. um, and that could simply mean selecting outside materials for people to use internally and learn from, or editing those materials, or presenting a live class. But somehow we've gotten to the point now where IDs, for the most part, are lousy content developers. And, and it's not their fault. They haven't been trained in graphic design, audio, video, motion, and all the things that go into producing high quality video in 2020, high quality content in 2022. So what we have is a bunch of people who've been trained in lame tools without mm -hmm. necessarily the back design skills in order to produce, to produce content. They're not using their skills necessarily in research analysis, project management. So I think the first role is that traditional ID, that project manager role, that person who decides what's the path do we need, need to take. Is training even needed here? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just a job aid. Maybe it's just support. Maybe you just need to sit down and talk to somebody <laughs> and give them this information. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not a training issue. Maybe it's a bit, maybe it's a behavior issue. You know, and that's what an ID should be sorting out. And then managing the process of developing the content. That's role number two. Someone like me, I come from a development, web development, and design background. That's what I did before I entered learning. So I can create engaging content that gets the message across. Mm -hmm. I certainly, for years, didn't come up with the own message. That should come from the instructional designer. But if we have skilled people on both ends, we have skilled people who are providing the instructional structure, managing the project, evaluating, making sure that we are moving towards stated educational goals or stated behavioral change goals. And then we have someone else who's really skilled at putting together a slick package that engages people in the modern media era. We're going to be much further ahead than if we have, you know, someone using some, uh, some, uh, rapid authoring tool that is just basically a PowerPoint plugin to make media that looks like it's from 1995. Mm. Nice. All right. What about, um, so it, I guess, where do I want to go next with this? You've talked about the importance of visual design and digital learning, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, and we all know it. I mean, anybody who is silly, you, you can't. Well, we, not... don't, we, we don't all, we don't all know it. I, I put this oh, up really? on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. I got pilloried by people who were very, very oriented towards the research that said, oh, you can learn from stuff that's not visually attractive. And my argument again is if you consume it, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of people judge a book by its cover and judge its credibility, entertainment value and engagement value by the look of the first slide in that deck. I mean, I've been to, I've been to you know sessions called visual design for e learning that were undermined by the quality of the title slide. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's a it's a given that people think visual design design is important. Mm. How much of that is that people don't think it's important as much as I kind of my mind kind of goes back to the university with you know five hundred professors or you know these things where they just don't, they don't have access to a designer or a design team or anything like that. And so they're going to be delivering the best that they can when, you know, their, their, their real wheelhouse is physics or, you know, French literature yeah. and design isn't, isn't that. And so, especially sort of from a young adult learner perspective, that's the best that is, it, that, that can be put on the table. What do you think about that? I think, 
I think a lot of people's opinions on some of these issues, I get the feeling are based on their need to survive at their job and in the industry. Mm -hmm. And if they are not trained in it and can't do it, the importance level in in some ways is reduced. You know, if you are not skilled at, haven't been trained at, learned to make things visually appealing and credible and pleasant for the user, then, um, you know, you you might, as a matter of survival, try and imagine that those things are unimportant. Mm -hmm. But visual design is inexorably linked to user experience and user interface design. And we know that a bad user interface on any electronic mediated media, electronic mediated media, that probably (laughs) wasn't a correct term, but in in any electronic media can be a hindrance to completion. Sure. I don't see, I don't see how we're different. I think sometimes there's, uh, we give ourselves a special dispensation because it's learning content from creating, you know, good user experience. And that doesn't have to be complicated, but, you know, I always make this argument. Right. If you say visual design doesn't matter, what if I give you dark gray text on a dark on a black background? That's a design choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now the visual design is so bad it interferes with people's learning. And I think people don't realize that, you know, even from a theoretical basis, um, you know, cognitive load theory, which is talked about a lot, you know, sometimes this poor interface stuff and poor visual design can can get to a point where it does cause cognitive overload. So I think, you know, even if you don't value design, because a lot of people reduce it to making things pretty, which is not my definition of design at mm-hmm. all. Um, you, you should be cognizant and aware of how bad design affects the user experience, let alone, right, what about learner satisfaction? Were they satisfied with the experience? Yeah, you may have drilled the information into their head and, and you know, but maybe they resented the process. Right. You mm-hmm. know, I really like to think when you are, especially because, you know, new employees do a lot of onboarding training and, and consume a lot of learning content, especially at larger companies where they have a formalized onboarding process, it usually involves video and e-learning courses and all these different things. What impression are you giving that new employee about the organization that they just joined? If the learning content looks like it's from 1995, and isn't doesn't have a slick visual design isn't navigable isn't engaging what message are you sending these people now who you are trying to get engaged in the company brand uh, you know and it, it that really rings true i mean i'm my as everybody knows who's listened to this i mean i've got a 13 year old and to hear his critique of even some of the things that either my wife or i bring home or you know that that we're that we see from our companies he's like wow you know just and then if you know you just put let's put 10 years on him those individuals who are coming out of university and and you're you're trying to bring into your company culture what do you know at the end of the day you, i think at, you're, i think you're preaching the gospel right there for sure at, at 13 he could be in, he could be engaging in learning content for his new job in 3 years well but it's not even exactly and i it's right. funny but people act like those audiences, those those Gen Z audiences, are so far from the work. They're not though. They're not though. They're I not. actually talked right. to them. All, I actually talked to them every day, and, and this is obviously, you know, the whoever it is, the child protective services cannot be. But it's, I'm just like, I'm like, look, you know, you could you could probably actually go on Upwork and you know get a graphic design job because he's actually pretty good at this, right? And uh-huh. I'm like, why don't you why don't you kind of try your hand? Go make ten bucks. Go make twenty bucks. You know, get get yourself a small gig and and actually make it better for some adult somewhere, right? Because he I've, has I've, I've intuitively the that, skills, right? He's got the intuitive, like, hey, what is hot and hip, right? I've, I've often wondered if the people that I've hired off of Upwork were 13. <laughs> so, which, you know, it could totally be the thing, right? That, that could totally be a, a good thing. But anyway, let's, we, we digress, I guess. Where, um, so I, I, I just, you, you, were, I, you were speaking in, in a language that, I, I really understand. I, I spent a long time in the software industry myself. And one of the things that I kept preaching is the salesperson was, we don't want to have the person who's developing it actually design the interface or actually design the experience. They're, they're great at understanding how the functionality comes to fruition, but we need to have, we need to listen to the customer. This is, you know, this is sort of design 101. Like what, what do you, how do you actually want the experience to play mm-hmm. out for the, what, does that play out in terms of the instructor as well? Uh, in, in your mind, so. is that what you were basically just saying? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, when when the web friend, I'm old enough to have been. Hey, you know, I got a lot of gray hair. Working. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm 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 turning 48 in a few weeks. So I mean, I was there for the beginning of this. And do you remember webmaster, like this term webmaster? And the oh, webmaster yes. used to like you know update the site and create. And the webmaster, which to me always brought weird images of like some guy like chained to a wall dungeons and dragons right he's the webmaster but the webmaster used to do everything right and the webmaster usually came from a programming background because in 1995 you had to write html um and 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 more or less that was it maybe pearl or something on the back end Mm -hmm. in order to run the website so a lot of those people who were the first generation webmasters were programmers But then very quickly, people realize this is a media and commerce engine. And we can't trust, you know, these guys who can't match their clothes, these men and women who can't match their clothes, Mm -hmm. you know, as traditional programmers, (laughs) to be doing the visual design. Mm -hmm. It is a specialization. And if you look at big companies, you know, they have product designers, product managers, uh, user experience experts. We don't have any of that. And we're in just as visual a medium. Because for some reason, we've, as an industry, become a little bit deluded into the idea that, you know, one person, one instructional designer can can do it all. And, and I think we've got a huge, huge mis- mismatch between how we're training instructional designers, where their talents lie, and what they're doing day to day. Which, by the way, I think is one of these reasons that we're seeing the rise of these kind of boot camps now where people are doing these short courses that are very targeted towards um, very targeted towards what instructional designers are actually doing. Mm. Reserving mm-hmm. judgment on whether or not they're valuable, I think the reason that we're seeing them is obvious. There's a huge gap 